Hi, welcome. This is uh, Green at Google. Uh, I'm Brad Templeton, and today we have Oliver Kuttner from Edison 2. This company was the company that won the X Prize for the most efficient car that was sponsored by Progressive Insurance. In this contest, people had to make cars that could go better than 100 miles per gallon. They surprised everyone by actually winning with a liquid fuel powered car when the rules had been aimed very much for an electric car to win. So Oliver has been committed to making cars lighter and more efficient and is now planning to use his prize money to commercialize what they built into a consumer car that's the most efficient out there. So Oliver. Okay, unfortunately we've already used more than the prize money, <laughs> but uh, we see a clear opportunity. So basically, as you said, we, the whole thing began with the X Prize. Um, it, it wasn't looking for the most efficient car, it was looking for a car that is better than 100 miles per gallon and meets a whole series of other criteria. It had to seat four people, it had to be producible, it had to have structures that with some modifications could meet all the safety standards. It, there were a lot of other things. It had to meet, if you decided to burn fuel, uh, emission standards, which turned out to be probably the single hardest thing. Anyway, um, you preempted it, we did win it. Um, what I did is I pulled together a group of people from motorsports, which is something that I've been interested in all my life, and some aerodynamicists, and uh, put together a team. All together we were almost 100 people, about 20 core people. The big aha moment was the initial analysis. I, I really believe that it's time well spent to really study stuff up front, rather than guess at it and start working. And, uh, at the time, I didn't know much about efficiency cars, but racing, of course, is, is efficiency because you have to do everything in a fixed time and you don't want to burn fuel and you want to go as fast as you can and all those things are trade-offs of efficiency. And at the time, I remember the president had pretty much announced that we didn't have an energy problem because hydrogen fuel cells were coming and we were going to have a hydrogen economy. And so it was natural for us to evaluate that first. And in very short order, we found problems like a typical gas station has a certain number of BTUs that it dispenses every day. And that's roughly equivalent to a single tanker truck of gasoline. If you wanted to fill that gas station with hydrogen, you'd have to bring in 22 tanker trucks. The mechanics of it became difficult. Forget about the fact that it's corrosive and you don't know where the hydrogen comes from. The message in this was um, that those in charge don't necessarily know. And this is a message that we've been carrying all along. <coughs> Hybrids are the answer, I'm going to get to that shortly. And electric cars is the current maybe crashing story. To me, losing was not an option. So we basically looked at everything from the ground up. And one of the first things we did is we said, well, how do you measure fuel efficiency? We took we looked at most of the main standardization bodies, Japan, Germany, uh, USA, and we found that the EPA is probably the single best institution. Their test cycles are very representative of what actually happens. And what you're looking at is a graph of a city cycle. It's a very prescribed acceleration braking situation. And you can translate that into energy spent as a function of what it is you're moving. If it's heavier, you need more energy. So what is interesting to note in here is the blue lines are energy spent. The red line is energy available for recovery if you could grab it all. The green line is the cumulative energy spent and the purple line is the cumulative total energy available for recovery. Now we know that a very great company, Toyota, has really perfected the hybrid. And on a good day they can capture 30% of the recoverable energy. That means 30% of the purple line, which means the potentially recoverable energy is not so big. So making a hybrid out of a car doesn't get you to a paradigm shift. It is worth it. And you can take that math further and you can look at the weight of a car. And the difference between the green line below and the red line is essentially the profit from going hybrid. And as you notice, as the cars get heavier, going hybrid is worth more and more which means a bus that's hybrid makes a lot of sense. But on the converse, as you get down to a thousand pounds, 
what you gain from going hybrid is minuscule. As a matter of fact, it may be so little that the hybrid gear costs you more than what you gain. Now, the other thing is in racing, you learn in order to win, first you must finish. So, if you add a hybrid gear, an electric drive, you have two drive lines, you have a much higher likelihood of a mechanical failure, and this was a one-time shot at making money. So, we didn't want it. So, in the end result, we decided we're going to go with gasoline. We decided to run E85 because it gave us some advantages in the way the uh, emissions were. And in miles per gallon equivalent, we were able to record 129 on the highway, and uh, final X prize, I think we got 102.5, but in the lab, we actually got 109 as a combined cycle efficiency. Um, the car had an unprecedented combination of low weight and low aerodynamic drag. We beat both our targets in those numbers. We did not beat our target in the brake specific fuel consumption of the engine. But all in all, it was enough. And it was interesting because two years before we ran XPRIZE, we predicted we might get 110 miles per gallon, and we actually got 109. Um, the most significant number is that our car can go 60 miles an hour using 5.3 horsepower. Now, the XPRIZE, some laugh at it and see it as a science project. It clearly was a science project, but you have to start with a science project. At Google outside, you have cars that have big things on top, and they look like a science project. But they're amazing cars, and they're clearly the future. So we all start somewhere. Um, since the XPRIZE, we've been working on turning the science project into a product that consumers might want. One of the things we did recognize, even though we were very skeptical about electric cars initially, is that I believe today that electric cars are the mandatory inevitable future of automobiles. They make a lot of sense. They are quite wonderful. Um, there are economic reasons to go that way, but they also are the only path to truly something promising in the future. The, in effect, what we've done is by creating a very light car, we've solved the battery problem. Because when a car is very light, it needs less energy which means you can carry a smaller battery, which means the battery costs less, which means your charge time is shorter. To really put it in perspective, this car, which Brad saw uh, some months ago, was here, um, can be charged at any 110 volt outlet in this room. In six hours, you get a full charge for 100 <coughs> miles. If you want to drive this car cross country, like I did recently, you can buy a two kilowatt hour Honda generator that weighs 44 pounds, and put it in the trunk and plug in an extension cord and you can pretty much drive to the other side of the country by putting gas in it. What is quite stunning is this very efficient car using the Honda generator only gets 44 miles per gallon. What this tells you is how you lose and lose and lose. It's the compounding effect of losing. And this is what I was trying to explain to you. So this generator converts gasoline into electricity the electricity goes into a battery and comes back out. And every time you lose a few percentage points, and by the time you're done, the 109 mile per gallon, 129 mile per gallon highway car gets 44 miles per gallon. Okay, there are a lot of lessons that we've learned, but I will say electric cars are the future. They need to be. Now, fuel price is not what's going to change the world. Um, in Europe, there are plenty of people buying Porsche Cayennes and gasoline's $10. What will change the world is that worldwide CO2 regulations are now real. They are here. In the US specific, this is a graph that we prepared some months ago. These are the current regulations starting in 2017, 2016 through 2025. And the red dots are the larger volume cars sold in the United States today. The fleet averages must be below the lines and the line allows a larger car to have more CO2. That's why it's a, a curved line. But you can figure out very quickly that the average is way above the lines, and every year the line drops. Essentially, the industry is in trouble. The industry was counting on electric cars being large, larger scale adopted. They would be compliance boosters. Those cars are not selling in numbers. Um, 
this is here, this is real, and this will change the industry. At this point in Detroit and everywhere else in the world, people are really starting to wonder what to do. Because as opposed to every other law before, the penalty for not complying means you lose your license to sell cars in the United States. This means that a company like Land Rover, Jaguar, or Mercedes could be faced with not selling a single car. And that is catastrophic. So, so losing this is not an option. Essentially, they have the same task that I had five years ago with XPRIZE, just bigger numbers. And currently, everybody thinks they're going to keep doing business as usual and shave off a little here and shave off a little there. This is going to cost billions of dollars. If you do it correctly, you might meet the standards. But I do ask, where do you go from there? Because you're now pulling out all your weapons. And even if you meet the standards with all your weapons, at some point, you're going to run out of ammunition. And all of these technologies make a lot of sense. But it goes to the old Einstein saying, if you want to come out with a different outcome, you have to approach the problem differently. And I will drive this point home with this slide. In my opinion, this is the actual efficiency limit of a car. Essentially, cars are architecturally all the same. Today's cars are based on a 1959 Mini. They are front engine, transverse, front wheel drive cars for the most part. They have McPherson strut suspensions, which in my opinion define the weight of a car. And to me, the most efficient non-hybrid Gasoline burning car to date is the 1992 General Motors Ultralight with a carbon fiber chassis designed and built by the winner of the first X Prize, Berg Rutan. It was a car built, cost no object, and it was a car built at the direction of General Motors management that was supposed to get 100 miles per gallon. It did not. It got 88 miles per gallon in the highway cycle. The reason is this architecture defines a glass ceiling. You can improve direct injection a little more. You can do this a little more, this a little more. You're not going to break the numbers. As opposed to this, you take our very simple car, 129 miles per gallon in the same test with a steel frame, a new system, and much lower cost because it's architecturally different. The industry hasn't lost the thought that maybe they have to change something. These are some examples of some Tasters. I think the industry is trying to find out what else they can sell. I think the industry is petrified. And um, they're starting to try some things. Volkswagen is, I think, the most forward pushing, visible company. I have a feeling that inside Toyota, there's every bit as much going on. This Toyota that I, that I photographed in Geneva had a very thin wall steel chassis tubing frame filled with foam. It had a center spine. Those were all things that we had thought about. Made a lot of sense. I, these guys, they've been around the block on this, and they're very good. I don't know about the rest of the industry. I think there are some big macro trends that will also push. One is transportation electrification is going to probably be driven most by the fact that Electric cars are essentially coal burners. And the green population doesn't want to hear it, but that's the truth. And eventually, hopefully, they're all solar powered. But in the interim, they're burning coal. And coal is the cheapest BTU on the planet. So they actually have a cost advantage if you can reduce the battery cost. Congested cities are going to drive some things. I think your driverless cars are in part about it. And uh, shared ownerships. I think are going to only increase. A big issue, in my opinion, is job scarcity. Um, requirements for local content will increase. Balance of trade, local content requirement. These are huge issues. This is what has killed Greece. This is what is killing Spain, Portugal, possibly France, Belgium, and Italy. The world cannot keep going with shifting bounds of trades. And automobile manufacturer is the single biggest violator besides oil. If a country, if the United States just fixed its automobile <coughs> importing problem and its fuel importing problem, we would have no bounds of trade issues whatsoever. And Greece essentially had no car manufacturing. 
And that, in many ways, was the root problem of why Greece is where it is. So this is a problem that's not going away, and the way you solve it is you start to make cars in your more localized environments, or parts for it. And then I think there's a huge opportunity as I travel around the world all the time. There are all these low-cost bad cars that are made by the millions, that pollute like crazy, that cost very little, that are 1950s technology, and our large companies have no answers to compete with these cars. But these cars really should be displaced by a more elegant product. And in our company, one of the principles that we pursued, we pursued all the X-Prize requirements, but we added one requirement. We said, listen, if we're going to fail, we want to have something that's worth something. So we said, we want to design the Volkswagen of the 21st century. The car must be low cost. So here is where we're going. And I will explain to you why Edison 2 is a completely different company than any other company. It begins with a different architectural approach. The very light car has self-contained suspension systems inside the wheel itself. This is important because the real estate in the wheel is not normally used in a car. And by putting the suspension inside the wheel, we drive it down to a single connection point, which then feeds four main connection points for the chassis. Four connection points in a chassis is much less complicated than the 16 or 20 you would find in a typical car. And when you have these fewer points, <coughs> the geometry of the chassis becomes easier, the material content of the chassis becomes easier, therefore the chassis becomes lighter. And the whole thing is a virtuous circle. If the chassis is lighter, my brakes are smaller. My engine is smaller, my transmission is smaller. And it goes on and on and on. This suspension is a product that we believe has a lot of value, and we're actually going to launch a new company that will only promote the suspension, which, in our opinion, can take about 200 pounds out of any existing car simply by redirecting its chassis requirements and add a flat floor, which gives you an aerodynamic benefit, and gives you additional space under the hood and in the trunk. And additional space in a car is at a premium today, because cars are becoming so complicated. So we have high hopes for this company, which should launch in uh, quarter two, 2013. But the other, you know, we're, we're still dreaming to go to a car. Um, the other issue is, a light car to be safe. A light car always loses the battle of momentum in a crash. And it is unacceptable that you have a car in which you die in an accident. From motorsports, we know a lot about high impact crashes. And essentially, it's also a change in architecture. It's a change in approach. We embrace the idea of deflection. In a normal car, you absorb a crash and you engage the other car. In our situation, we prefer to jettison parts and deflect the crash. And this is really brutally driven home in an actual crash test following the IIHS 40% offset crash protocol, in which we recorded 21 Gs. To put it in perspective, this is a crash I'm willing to sit in the car with a seatbelt, not even an airbag. 21 Gs is probably the lowest ever recorded data for this. Maybe a Plymouth Prowler, because the Plymouth Prowler, by accident, does the same thing. This comes out of motorsports. We all know about high impact crashes. And the other part that we use is we substitute space for our lack of mass. If you look at this top view, you see the flat places that connect our wheels with the body. Those are purely structure. There's no suspension in there because the suspension is in the wheel. So this structure is designed to absorb. So in a side impact, uh, in any number of impacts, you have a lot more absorption space, which you need to take care of the added accelerations which you have to face. So the third thing is that we are all about cost. And cost to me is what drives it home in the end. And here's just a simple explanation. I 
like station wagons, and station wagons became minivans, they became SUVs, and I would argue they're going to go back to being station wagons. And if you follow our prescription and you just want a gas-burning station wagon, 60 miles per gallon is no problem whatsoever. And essentially, over the life of a car, you end up with a free car. And when you get the numbers so different that you end up with a free car, the customer base exists, even if some people look at it and raise their eyebrows initially, because money does talk. And it gets really extreme when you build an electric car with a range-extending engine. Um, the lowest energy cost of operating car out there is likely a Toyota Prius, which can do this drive cycle for about $15,000 in the US. And we can do the same drive cycle for 5500 Same service, four people my size. So it shows you how brutal the numbers get. Um, the architectural implications are we're all about cost. And cost is about extreme parts count reduction and reduction in material. I'll first talk about material. The average car in America costs $6 a pound. If you build the car out of conventional materials, you can keep those numbers. An expensive car, let's say an Audi with an aluminum chassis, might cost $20 a pound. When you bring the car down to 1,300 pounds with full content, it stands to reason that it's going to cost less money. Um, how do we do it? Parts count reduction. We basically put most of the complicated parts into a few castings that are strategically located, and everything else is connections, either deflecting and absorbing, or we don't let anybody in because we're going to keep you alive. Those are the two structures. And if you insist that you want to have a car that's a box, you can use our architecture, get the benefit of the lightweight, and make it look like a box. Personally, I don't like boxes. I can see tremendous potential for our designs. You have additional wing areas. I mean, they will become high-performance cars of unbelievable dimensions, and it's just a lot of fun. Um, I also believe that the extensive use of plastics is essential because you can fully recycle the plastics and once again with molded plastics you can create further parts count and cost reduction because a molded part can take many many functions into one part and one thing that's interesting here this is one of our development chassis if you look at it that's a full driveline equipped chassis and look at the front bumper and the rear bumper and you see all this empty space what happens is by making the car so light the drive line becomes so small, the car becomes entirely space for the user. These cars have big trunks, even though they don't look it. They're actually big inside. They can fit big people. But they, are, they give you the space where you need it. They don't give you the space where you don't need it. In a normal car, a third of your car is just your engine compartment. It gives you no other service. So it's interesting to note. And ultimately, I can see a scenario where you end up with a plastic car with less than 30 parts, with less than 30 castings, and a few other components. And now you're in a whole other dimension. It's really a new product. Our goal is to go to a new distribution model. Um, the complicated parts will be made centralized. They will have some intensive tooling, will cost some money. And then, depending on where the cars are made, they get assembled more locally essentially like flat packs, a little bit of version like an IKEA, except the assembler is a professional. And that way, you can end up with a car factory in Greece, because you're essentially looking for a large warehouse. And you ship in some parts. And maybe the engines come from China, from, uh, let's take Cherry, for example, or Tata. Both of them make 600 to 700 cc two-cylinder engines. They can be sourced for $1,000. That's fuel injection to catalyst. They're nice aluminum engines, and they can give you the service that you get from a Volkswagen Jetta TDI. And so you end up with the parts coming in, and you essentially have a large glorified warehouse in which you assemble the cars. The Edison 2 is a, essentially an R&D company. We're not married to become a Tesla. We're not married to being anything. We are married to being successful. 
we're married to our product becoming a large volume situation. We have, at this point, we're, I don't know, I, uh, we're raising a little bit more money. Edison 2 is pretty much done. We're going to have a suspension company, which is a sales company. And uh, in 2014, we intend to uh, raise the big money and go toward production of our car. And by that time, we believe we will have solved virtually all the issues. We have, uh, we have a car that's now maybe seven weeks away from driving that is essentially the efficiency that you've seen. You've seen this car, except it drives like a Toyota Camry. It has the suspension travel. It has all the functions of what people want. And, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, but we're getting there. I believe in looking at this from an outsider, um, the big problem in the car business is that it is so money intensive and that it has kind of killed itself. Essentially, the car business has taken all the margin out. And when you have no margin, there's huge risk aversion and unwillingness to change. And up until a year ago, I was unwilling to try to become a car company. And at this point, our group's moving in that direction, whether it becomes that we become a division of somebody or our own car company remains to be seen. But we really think we can do it, deliver a full leap. And the main reason we think so is because we think the large companies are going to be very, very challenged in moving quickly because there are so many people, so many layers of management, and because what we are doing can so destabilize them um, because they have such big investment. So in this, I actually see an opportunity. Essentially, we're a whole new product. We're not a car. We're not a motorcycle. We're a very light car, but it's architecturally completely different. It will cost much different money to operate. And I think it opens a whole new dimension. I mean, here I'm sitting in the middle of Google's uh, place, and we're surrounded by all kinds of high-tech companies. I think that in the automobile business, there will be a rescaled parts business because the idea of having engines of 2,000 or 5,000 cc's moving cars that move one person is not sustainable and makes no sense at all. There's, the proportions are just wrong. And I think that there's a great opportunity. The other thing is I was a car dealer. I was a BMW dealer for a while. And I um, find it stunning how the car companies are trying to have all the business. And they've really taken the joy out of owning a car. They don't let you modify it. They don't let you in it. They don't let you understand it. So in this thought that some cars are going to want to be shared ownership cars, our intention is to build very simple cars, very simple base cars that are open to modification. So some people may buy them as a fleet for shared ownership, while other people may buy them and third parties may make things to upgrade them. Essentially, like an Android platform with apps. You know, you customize your computer all the time. There's a huge business around this. There's not such a big business around the car, because the car from the people who make the car is essentially protected. We're going to be open to changing that. I mentioned it earlier. There's just a wrong proportion. Moving 200-pound people, even four people at 800 pounds with 4,000-pound boxes, just doesn't make sense. It's not sustainable. It's too much material, too much energy. And I want to point out one example. A very light car chassis today weighs less than 100 pounds. It's aluminum. Part of it's cast. Part of it's stamped. Uh, it's riveted and glued together. That 100 pounds of aluminum is the same 100 pounds of aluminum you save by cutting your engine size in half. Sitting here at Google, I wonder about your driverless cars, and, and I can see a future where everybody has a driverless car, where smaller cars um, have small batteries and have relatively short range, have some contactless charging on a highway, and become very affordable because they're so simple. And I can actually see a driverless small car obsoleting public transport because you now have individual mobility <coughs> with the efficiency of public transport or better 
Um, and because you're Google systems, you can really pack them into road systems and really solve some of these issues that seem almost unsolvable. The big congested traffic situations, etc. So in a way, it's a very exciting time, and it's a lot of dots that have to be connected. But uh, I don't know. I, here's a bit of a, a brochure thing that we're working on, and it, in the final page, you see a little bit where we're going. This will be the first car we will actually uh, offer, or what we think we will offer. And it's a hybrid car. It can run on two different modes, on a gasoline mode and an electric mode. And you read the data, it's a pretty peppy car. It's something that makes somebody who has a 3 Series BMW isn't going to be sorry by switching to this car. But it's a stunning performance efficiency ratio. And because of the low parts count and the low mass, we think we can deliver it at a whole new price value. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.